Hey everyone, welcome to the Hacktorial. Uh, we're going to get started in a few minutes after people file in.
Yo, Steph. Steph, when the talk's going, can you take a picture? I need to show Dean Chang that I gave a talk. This is for my capstone. <laughs> Not now, like when it's done. Yeah. Oh my God. I'm giving like four workshops as part of my capstone. <laughs> I just realized this being broadcast right now. Hello, folks. We're just going to take another minute and then get started. We're going to get started in just a minute here. Does everyone have Sketch and Illustrator installed? Raise your hand if you need help getting that set up. OK, cool. Uh, if at any point through the talk you do need that, um, just uh, hang out with your neighbor and work together with them. All right. All right, folks, uh, we'll get started now. Um, welcome to the Designing with Grid Tactorial. Uh, this event's put on through Terrapin Hackers. Very appreciative for their works to, to make it happen. Shout out to Rex in the corner. This is his first Hactorial that he's putting on, so we'll see how it goes for him. <laughs> Woo! All right. Um, so in this talk, we're going to explore a few different concepts. Um, but it all kind of revolves around this idea of grids. Um, if grids is a totally foreign word to you in this context, uh, don't worry. We'll get into exactly what that means. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the theory behind it and also how it can be used in context for, uh, for design, uh, through identity design, like logos and branding, uh, and then through user interface design in uh, websites and mobile apps. Um, so what is a grid? Does anyone have any ideas? I'll just take one one hand raise. Someone needs to sacrifice themselves. All right, Ibrahim, what's up? 
What do you think a grid is? It's a good start. So Ibrahim said it's a series of equidistant lines. Um, that is certainly what it appears to be in this image. Um, what uh, one of the big misconceptions of using grids in design is, um, is is that it is solely like this kind of equidistant grid. A uh, grid is also used to explain things like column systems or vertical rhythms and baseline grids and things like that. Um, so while this is kind of the quintessential grid, um, we're going to get into some stranger grids that help people do uh, some more advanced things, perhaps uh, more so in web design than anything else. Um, so um, grids can be used in identity, as I said. Uh, that's a fancy word for logos and the surrounding business behind it. Um, and in honor of the event coming up this weekend, um, here's a quick look of how grids can be used um, in identities to make really orderly designs. Um, so you start out with something, like Ibrahim said, a series of equidistant lines, creating squares and space between them. Um, we create shapes based on that order system um, and eventually create it into a brand. Uh, grids can also be used in web design. Um, so this is an example of uh, the 960 grid in place. Uh, it's a really popular grid system that people use online. Um, and you can just see sort of through this small sample uh, that it is used to order the different containers and, and divs and images uh, that create a website. Grids are also used in mobile apps. Uh, the user interfaces for these. Um, they're similar to how things work in web um, in that you use them to space things apart in an orderly way, uh, set expectations for how big, how small, how spaced apart things are, um, and then yeah, create order through, the, through all the objects. Cool, even uh, this slide uh, and the rest of the talk, for that matter, is using grids. Uh, to keep things orderly. So really, it can be used in print, branding, web, logos, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you have ever worked with me, you know I go crazy over grids. Um, grids are often the thing that um, if you look at something you've created and it just looks a little bit off, uh, it doesn't look exactly right to you, chances are that if you threw a grid on it and made things uh, stick to the proper proportions, um, it would be a lot better. So what exactly do grids provide? Um, they provide proper proportions, um, you know, being able to embrace correct aspect ratios or um, you know, the beautiful golden ratio or one to one, one to two, one to four, one to eight uh, ratios between the objects and the sizes of the, of the things that you're making. Uh, grids can be used to direct hierarchy, um, often through sizing and positioning. Um, they can create balance, uh, you know, left and right, up and down, um, the way that things distribute their visual weight across a page uh, can often be organized through grids. Uh, and finally, maybe most important, they, they provide order. Um, and in a totally boundless world of, of web design or, or app design or logos, um, you know, order is really critical uh, in terms of um, keeping things grounded and making sure that a user or a, a customer can relate to your product. Um, so, hi, I'm Jeff. Um, I go here uh, at Maryland. Um, I've worked on a number of design teams, and I'm right now running a design agency myself called Minimill. Um, and I am stuck in this software and grids every single day. Um, so hopefully I can take that out of the office and uh, share it with you. Cool, so um, before we get into some of the applications of grids, um, I want to talk about some of the history uh, this will go into art theory. Maybe Gira can help a little bit. Uh, I'm not actually an art student, but I've taken one class in which I learned most of this, so we'll see what happens. Um, so we start with, uh, with this. This was a tool uh, used uh, since ancient times. Uh, it's called the Van de Graaff Canon. I think it was also called the Villard uh, Diagram is another name for it that I saw around the web. Um, this was used to imagine you, you don't even have a printing press yet, um, but you do have a big broad sheet of paper. Um, and what are people using paper and design for? Books, um, Bibles, and, and everything in between, newspapers. Um, so without any sort of digital tools or 
advanced machinery to help them. Um, they use this analog method to define where on the page their content should go. Um, and you can kind of follow along here. Imagine taking a, an equally sized broadsheet, um, that broadsheet meaning it's going to be your left and right pages, um, you know, split in the middle. Um, and the end result we're going for is this red square in the middle. Um, so you can fold that corner to corner to get that big long stroke along the, the center. Uh, fold that both ways, and the intersection of that will create an up and down line. Uh, you make that fold, and then from there, or actually these aren't folds, but I'm thinking origami style. They're probably marking it with a very light pencil or something. Um, from there, you can take the top of the top line, or the middle line, and bring it down to the bottom corner, and the intersection of that and the overall um, diagonal line can make an upwards line, and then that diagonal to the intersection of the other diagonal, <laughs> you see where I'm going. Anyway, you can construct this totally analog, no tools needed, um, and it helps define where on the page you can start your content. Um, there were lots of different systems like this, but the whole point was there was a very defined and orderly system for how you're aligning and laying out your content. Uh, from there, we have um, a foreign European I don't know how to say this without butchering it. Uh, this means the new typography. And this guy, Jan Tischold, uh, in the 20s, uh, kind of pioneered this idea that you can use typography and in your publications, your layouts, your books, uh, your posters, uh, in this new way, in this very orderly way. Uh, and a lot of people followed this idea um, and you know, brought on a lot of like modernist art, um, or in, you know, for our purposes, um, modernist uh, publications or, or layouts or things beyond art and more towards design serving the people. Um, so stemming from uh, the new typography was this international typographic style. Um, this came over a long period of time, uh, had its heyday in the you know, 20s through 50s and, and onwards, um, but you might know this as Swiss design. Um, so if you've ever seen um, you know, a poster, or actually very similar to how I designed these slides. This is basically designed in the, in the Swiss style, in the international typographic style. Um, it uses, uh, you know, very strict grids and, um, and simple, minimal uh, typography and images to create um, an aesthetic. Um, and this quote I really like uh, that emerged during this period was that the solution to the design problem should emerge from its content. So it says that you're not creating art and then kind of figuring out what goes in it. Um, you're, you're defining the content first and letting that inform the layouts and the, the systems and the grids. Um, here's a, an idea of, of sort of the stuff coming out of this. Um, Accidents Grotesque was a very popular type face back then. Uh, it inspired things like Helvetica that you all use today. Um, and it, it, was a, it was a huge staple among the Swiss style. Um, and now we get into um, what I view as like the start of the like formal grid system, um, which, or rather, the start of of like the theory behind it, of of the the discourse around it. Um, so this dude named uh, Joseph Mueller Bach Brockman, excuse me, um, published this book uh, in 1968. Here's I think a 1980s version of it uh, that I pulled from the Startup Shell Library. If anyone wants to take a look at this, pass it around. Um, and this book kind of is the Bible for grids. Uh, it's still used today, um, you know, as a as a text that art students and designers will read. Um, and it it informs why you use grids, how they're set up, how they're constructed, how the descenders of the typefaces should be aligned with the baselines of the next line. Uh, really intricate stuff like that. Um, it's fun uh, if if you like reading, you know, three hundred pages of grids. Um, I haven't read all of it, but I like it. Um, and all of a sudden, from the 1968 to, I don't know what year this was, but um, the emergence of technology and, and design software was um, what I'll say is the next big step in, in grids and layouts. Um, this basically allowed people to go from, um, you have to know that like throughout all these systems, people are basically drawing this with pencils and rulers. Um, and taking photographs of layers of paper. Um, and the, the amazing technology we have today to create designs is, uh, is relatively new. Um, so here's an idea of just how impactful that was. 
Illustrator really changed things way back. It started making the computer a real graphics tool. I think I just saw the future and it just was really exciting to me. I just wanted to learn it. You never see anything do something like this before. You can make changes and things happen instantaneously. It's like magic. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's a just a promotional thing from Adobe, but uh, oh my gosh, I think it kind of characterizes the enthusiasm and excitement around um, the new technology that's that's there for us. Um, so the, the two pieces of technology we're going to play with today um, are called Sketch. This is by a company called Bohemian Coding uh, and Illustrator, which is from Adobe. Um, so make sure you have those installed or follow along with me or your neighbor. Um, we'll have fun with it. Um, but in the context of, of this historical walkthrough, um, Illustrator and similar pieces of software allow you to make sort of, not procedural, but uh, you know, generated grids instead of laying it out with a ruler, uh, which adds even more precision and locking to, um, to the designs you're creating. So using grids in logo design. This is the first exercise we're going to do. Um, and this will probably take up most of the, the session, since um, most of these concepts can also be used in the web design to follow. Um, so I'm going to open up Illustrator. Um, while you're doing that, I'll talk a little bit about what we use this for. Um, so the first concept that I want you guys to think about, um, we're about to create a corporate identity, a logo. Um, and in my world, we try to keep them as minimal as possible. The idea being that if you can create a mark that represents a brand um, and it's distributed worldwide, um, that you'll be able to or that your customers will be able to associate that with your product and your brand. Um, this idea itself was kind of pioneered by Paul Rand and some interesting designers from yesteryear. Um, and so one of the main ideas behind the way we design these logos with grids is that we want to use as few grids as possible, as few um, levels of fidelity as possible. So whenever I start a design, I'll use an 8 by 8 grid every single time when I'm starting to make a logo. Um, what this does is it forces me to distill a concept or a, a whole idea about what this brand is supposed to represent down to uh, one or two core concepts. And, and how can that be communicated in as simple uh, an implementation and an execution as possible? Um, so when we're using Illustrator today, we'll start every project in the 8x8 grid. Um, now, you might get to a point where, while using this 8x8 grid to make a logo, you need more resolution. Uh, maybe you know, the size of this stroke was just too big or just too small, so I need something in between. Well, what we do then is, oh my gosh, secret's out. Um, we'll double the, the resolution of our grid. So we'll go from 8x8 to 16x16. Uh, and what this will allow you to do is, as I said, get that you know, half step in between. Um, we're still using a grid, we're still keeping that order, um, but we have a step in between. And if you need more resolution, you can keep going bigger and bigger. Uh, and the whole idea here is that um, we're still using the same proportions. Um, they're just getting more and more fine. Um, so you might go from you know, a, um, a, a rectangle that has the ratio of 1 to 2, and you can now take that to 1 to 3, um, or, or anywhere in between. Um, that's kind of the main principle that or at least the main like workflow that I have for doing logo design. Um, and it allows you to do cool stuff like this. Um, taking you know, a bunch of uh, what we call primitives, so that's a shape that contributes to a new shape, um, and, and making something really beautiful and organic out of it, um, coming from a very strict, orderly grid system. Um, so everyone have Illustrator open or a way to follow along? Awesome. Um, the first thing, or I'm, I'm about to open Illustrator myself so I can follow along with you guys, um, but I want to make sure you guys are aware of a few keystrokes. Um, the main ones to know here are the toggle and snap to grid functions. Um, so this is uh, on Macs, th these are all Mac keystrokes, but if you're on Windows, uh, just replace command with control. 
Um, so to toggle your grid, you're going to use Command Apostrophe. So that's right next to the Enter key. Uh, and that'll toggle a grid on and off. Uh, and then to snap to grid, you'll do the same thing, but with Shift. Um, and you'll know what this means in a sec. The rest are, are pretty straightforward. Um, and, and as they come up, I'll, I'll mention them. Um, lots of other keystrokes to play with. OK, so uh, the things we're going to do in this exercise um, are all of these. Let's just hop in. i got to open Illustrator myself. Awesome. Uh, so the first thing on our agenda is to construct the grid. Um, so with Illustrator open, everyone uh, create a new document. So that's Command N or File New. Um, we're going to set this to the web profile. Uh, make the size 800 by 600. And make sure you check off, a l or uncheck rather, make sure this is unchecked, the align new objects to pixel grid. So those are the, the few things we'll do in the beginning. Again, web profile and then size 800 by 600 and uncheck the new, or uncheck the align to new pixel grid, align new objects to pixel grid. And press OK. Um, so this is our, our canvas, our artboard. Uh, everything gets created on this. 